Thinking elections gone, not as a new day. Anxious to see what's next. Pause. Think about it with intentional thought and consider where we go from here. Stay tuned and hear what Loretta Butler Turner has to say. Her perspective on what a new day's built, new built environment ought to look like. Join our co-sponsors, DomDev Enterprises and Page Investment, and our friends at Islandese Realty D1 Development and Sammy's Chicken. Share, 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 share this um, post with all your friends. Tell them we're live. Tell us where you're from, um, what you're listening to, and what you're thinking about. And we'll endeavor to answer all your questions as we go. We'll be right back. Something to think about with Dale Happy Knowles. Welcome to Something to Think About with Dale Happy Knowles. We're here this evening because we always say what we think we become. What we radiate, we attract. And what we imagine, we surely can achieve. Let's change the narrative two for two. So this evening, we have a special guest, a lady who is no stranger to most of you, but a lady who we feel of the talent, the strength, the wisdom to be able to answer all your questions that you have tonight. And she has a wealth of pedigree, um, political pedigree, and she also has a wealth of political knowledge about her. Um, she is an astute business lady. And before we go into all of that, welcome, Ms. Loretta Butler Turner. I would like to say thank you very much to Something to Think About uh, for inviting me to be your very special mm -hmm. guest um, just shortly after our uh, national elections. Thank you very much, Dale. You're very, quite welcome. And as I was saying that I couldn't think of anybody more pertinent and proper to ask to do this uh, discussion that we're going to have this evening because you have sat on all sides of the table in all intents and purposes in the political arena and in various hats in the political arena. And so from the water bottle carrier all the way up to the, the second in charge kind of thing. So, you know, you have a full scope of what people might have questions on and ask for. But, I will um, certainly as, try. I'll yes, certainly yes. Try. That's, that's what the good Lord put us here to do. And so for those who may not know, you're a very uh, astute business lady um, and so forth. You also would have been, like I said, in politics. You're a civic leader in many ways. And, um, and then you would have been able to become the vice president of the Organization of American States Inter-American Commission on Women and a founder of the National Heroes Committee. Those two stand out to me. But more importantly, there is this group called the INQDES, which you are a board member, which I'm hoping that we'll speak a little bit about as we go. And then you also are an activist of sorts for um, women's and gender equality, talent in the Bahamas and our heritage. Uh, I don't know if that covers the whole scope or you have anything else you want to add to that? No, I think you've covered the whole gamut. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes. And so as we indicated before, um, we want to be talking today about the question of what we have in this new day and how it ought to look for the Bahamian citizens in order to be able to start to maximize their opportunity for success, right? And what we've seen in um, September 16 was our general election here in the Bahamas. And so far, the government of the day was partially been formed. Part of the cabinet has been established yesterday and some more are to come. And so the, the prime minister, the Honorable Philip E. D um, Davis, um, is being very brave, in my opinion, that he is out the gate um, very early, right away, and he is trying to foster a united, uh, a nonpartisan, non-gender, 
uh, non-generational, non-class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, approach to addressing our needs at this time. Um, time will tell whether we see that in the long run, but um, that is the position that my, from my discussion with him, and when I got a little brief thing in there that he said what was his uh, agenda would be. And so we ask you, um, how easy a feat would that be for him well, to first achieve that? All, first of all, Happy, I think that the, um, the motto for the PLP who's won the government was a new day. Quite mm -hmm. fitting because I believe that in the scheme of things in the Bahamas, a lot of people were going through a lot of challenges and difficulties. And I think that since the election last week, as you've correctly noted, the prime minister has been out of the gate. Um, if he were a sprinter, I would say that he got out of the blocks very rapidly, very effectively. Hmm. And now the race must be run. Uh, in terms of the inclusion, I think that's going to be a very important and pivotal part of you know, governance hmm. for him. Because uh, when you look at the previous four years, a lot of people, because of various circumstances and probably because of the heavy handedness of executive orders, felt that they were not fully included, that they were not a part of the, um, the people who right. were promised that they would have been in the people's time. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's going to be very important for this administration to set very early on that their actions are going to be fully aligned with their promises. Uh, the honeymoon is not going to be long. Bahamians are very, have a very low toler tolerance these days for governments that are not going to make um, tangible changes. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that it's going to be a very difficult road. However, if the prime minister and his team of cabinet ministers and advisors and all of the um, other MPs that are elected remain in contact and a part of the people, mm -hmm. then they will be able to govern according to the wishes of the people. That's great, that's great. And so we, we hope that that is able to happen because we've had a void of that in recent times and so forth. So is that doable though? Will, um, that's a desire. But in our culture and our um, environment right now, is that doable that we can actually achieve where we are operating in unison and not because we've been so polarized for so long, unintentionally polarized compared to what he's trying to accomplish today? Well, I think that if you were to look at the election campaign and you want to talk about underdogs or persons who um, may have um, witnessed the campaign, Mm -hmm. where there was a lot of um, defamatory remarks made against the character of the individual, which mm -hmm. I think was really not um, the best uh, methodology for the free national movement to use because people were more concerned about um, issues and the ideas that were going to move the country forward. But having said that, is it going to be possible? We do not yet know if it's going to be possible, but what we do know is that we must remain at uh, the level of the people where we can communicate. And I'm saying we, because I mean, all of us are in this together, exactly. I would think, right. as mm -hmm. Bahamians. We're all stakeholders. And so the government has to understand that, you know, some of the things that they might have promised, some of the things they may have said may be delayed. Um, but the most important thing is to keep the lines of communication open with your stakeholders. When you communicate what the circumstances are and why you may choose to do what you have to do, I think people begin to you know, move in uh, sync with your vision. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that one of the biggest challenges we had in the last administration um, was the dismissiveness of some of our leaders as it relates to um, answering and being uh, accountable on matters that were important to all of us. Yes, well, that is key, as you mentioned, listening and like, well, Mr. Lucas, um, who would have trained me some time ago, would have said that there were four key criteria for every leader um, to be successful, and they were vision, mission, values, and behaviors. 
And so we've seen that the PLP has presented in their campaign a, um, a blueprint document that outlines um, what they want to do and also an economic um, plan and also a COVID plan, 10 point plan during the period. So it seems like the vision and, and the mission might be in place. And we know there's the values from 1953 that was already documented um, and so forth. So it's, it's just about the behavior now. And so um, if we look at this whole thing, then these are very basic activities that can happen. But um, I, think, I think just as we as Christians and faith believers use the Bible as our guide, mm -hmm. um, this blueprint that you've referred to that right. the POP um, put out prior to the election um, for political purposes, right. that has got to be their roadmap, their Bible, because mm -hmm. people are going to refer to that time and time again. And one of the things that you will find is that persons hang on to whatever is important to them mm -hmm. in those promises and so they're going to systematically go through that blueprint. And so every member of parliament who has a constituency has to realize that they will be made accountable, whether it's in the short term or whether it's five years down the road. So they have got to make that an integral part of their governance. Yes. And so, like I was saying, yes, that that that's going to be key because he's um, Lucas is saying that if we don't formulate these things, um, then leaders lose trust with those things and then they think they might not be important, but they are critical to a leader's success. And so the only one I think is questionable in my mind right now still is um, behaviors because behaviors you really can't project. You could have an idea, but you need to see action and so forth in the last two or three days, we've seen some action. and so from the actions that he, um, the leader has done in terms of, the prime minister has done in terms of selecting his cabinet, doing walkabouts and, and the communications. It is, um, what is your take on that as a, out the gate? I would like to say that, you know, if, if you're a moviegoer and I'm not, that this <laughs> is like the trailer, the preview as to what is to come. And yeah. so, you know, it certainly gets you excited. Um, it wants you to go out there to the, theater and watch this movie. So mm -hmm. if we were to translate that in terms of everyday life, yes, the mm -hmm. preview so far has been quite exciting. Um, I have spoken with scores of persons who mm -hmm. would have been initially, um, whether they were supporters or not, mm -hmm. having certain apprehensions and concerns about uh, the governance, the PLP government, the brave Davis-led administration, those questions were real. Right. Um, I think that already um, just looking at the moves that have been made in this preview, a lot of them are beginning to say, okay, well, you know, um, I like what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe I can give this movie a view. I Maybe I could be a participant in this. Right. And that is a good thing. Yes. And, and a participant is something that the people um, want drastically to be able to do, to participate in its governments. And so on this show, we subscribe to something called the new built environment, which is what we're trying to accomplish or what we're trying to encourage uh, people, government, private sector, the whole civic, everybody to work towards. And Madam Producer, if you would put up on the screen that what we, what we want to be able to do is to build an environment that is based on intentional thought and action, right? An environment for the political, for the political, economic, and social environment of our society, formulated based on intentional thought and action designed to create the greatest opportunity to build the highest level of the quality of life for our citizens and our partners. And then also to be able people who will support our culture to not push them aside, but to be there and then to make it sustainable for generations to come. And so, you know, we, we look from something to think about is going to analyze this blueprint and the movements of government with that perspective. And so 
what would you, your take on that perspective? Do you agree that that's what the people are generally looking for? Well, if I can use that as your mission statement for your um, show, which I think is um, all encapsulating, mm -hmm. I think that uh, any right thinking citizen, any right thinking stakeholder, you know, and that when I say stakeholder, resident, um, you know, whoever lives here in the Bahamas and calls it home, there, mm -hmm. should, there can be no argument with uh, this summation that uh, something to think about has put together. Now, one of the things that really stood out to me is that it's called the new built environment. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the important factors on sustainability, which you speak to in your last um, sentence, is our environment, our natural environment, mm -hmm. and how we as citizens are going to manage that, how we're going to protect that, how we're going to get the highest yield from that environment. Because mm -hmm. without, without a healthy environment, without a productive environment, then of course, the entire society and by extension, economics suffer. So I think this is a beautiful um, mission statement by something to think about. Thank you, thank you. So if we look at that now and we say, how would our administration pivot from being opposition to materializing initiatives in real time? Well, the pivoting part, it means you have to be agile, means that you have to be ready to make um, analysis, that you've got to be able to have empirical data to substantiate those decisions that you make. I think all too often, and I sort of, I watched your show last week, which I thoroughly enjoyed with your guests. Mm -hmm. I think one of one of the things that um, we lack in the Bahamas is a very strong uh, basis for making decisions in terms of data analysis and what the data actually says. Mm -hmm. And so we, we sometimes find ourselves as governments, as citizens making very emotional decisions, decisions that we feel are what the people want. Sometimes in governance, uh, you have to realize that it's not always exactly what we want to do mm -hmm. or what we desire to do because the circumstances or the, uh, the precipitating um, ideals are not there. So mm -hmm. I think that it's important that we start to look at the intelligence that one is able to utilize through technology, through the um, compilation of data, and then move forward. And I think that they would be able to pivot and make those decisions quite um, ably if they use those um, those measuring sticks for making right. those decisions. Yes. Folks, we're listening to something to think about with Dale Happy Nose, and we're here with Loretta Butler-Turner. And we're having a discussion, and we're trying to walk you through what might be going through the minds and, and what the new government might be experiencing. Um, my brother, um, uh, Madam Turner has been around the political um, arena for many, many years, and she's walked this walk. And so we want to ask her these questions to see her perspective on what the government might be thinking. So you will have an idea as to what they might be going through, and we could see how best the two could connect. So as we look at this, and we know that you're a nationalist, and, and this is a big thing for some to think about, that we look at things from a national point of view more so than any other perspective. Um, tell us, um, how does the people participate to ensure that the implementations of this government connects with the people's expectations? Well, first of all, before the people can participate, I think that no administration should come in with um, overly high expectations, giving the people mm -hmm. um, overly high expectations. We know that um, just two days after this administration would have been sworn in, that we got really bad news in terms of our financial crisis. Right. Right. We mm -hmm. know that over the last two years, we have been going through what the rest of the world is going through, um, the COVID pandemic. COVID. Mm -hmm. We also know that our healthcare system has been 
tremendously impacted by the immense amount of numbers that of persons who have gotten sick. So expectations must be carefully managed. Um, I think that one of the biggest reasons why people lose trust in leadership, governance, or any, any situation is when you paint um, extraordinarily high expectations and you're unable to deliver on those. So mm. we must ensure, first of all, that our government is being truthful with us. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the first thing. And secondly, how do we become participants? Well, it's very easy for us to become participants. First of all, we have got to equip ourselves as individuals first and those that are around us with the skills that we need to ensure that we do not become a burden on the system, that we are there to help the system as opposed to have the system totally carry us. Mm -hmm. Now, we also know that biblically they say the poor will be with us always. So we have to have regards for persons who are indigents, persons who are unable to actually care for themselves. That's fine because that is a part of governance. But those of us that are able-bodied, that are able to exist and maintain a level of um, livability that we're accustomed to, then we have got to do our role in helping the government. I think that would be the greatest partnership that we can do. And like yourself, as a person from an intellectual standpoint, being able to share with those around us what the realities are and how we can help ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so you mentioned two things there that, that stand out on skills and on the poor. I always say the poor is relative, and so if we raise our level high enough, then even the poor will still be looking pretty. But most of the poor are poor because they don't have skills that are in demand that people would want to pay them for and the like. At least that's my raw description, fundamental description. So how do, how do then either we identify the skills or we allow government to be able to provide programs for, because not everybody's going to be able to grab the skills on their own accord. Right? Well, you spoke earlier in my introduction about IncuDesk. I think that all too often we look to government or, you know, administrations mm -hmm. for all of our answers. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that I have done, you know, post political life is I said, you know, okay, if I cannot make a contribution on the political front, what can mm -hmm. I do in my community? And, you know, I don't know whether it was serendipitous or what, but, you know, I came across some young people whom I've known for a while who had several projects that they wanted to, to um, have guidance on. And so I think even those of us that have um, skill sets in terms of being able to pass on experience, being able to pass on knowledge, we can help. So IncuDesk is run by two 30-somethings. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if people are aware of it, but what it essentially did even before the government um, jumped in, the previous administration, that is, right. jumped mm -hmm. in with the SBDC, IncuDesk created an incubator system to enable um, individuals who might have had fledgling projects, persons who wanted to be able to become entrepreneurs, persons who wanted to become self-employed in whatever line of endeavor. And so IncuDesk has been very successful in um, providing environments that are not only um, all inclusive, but are also very affordable and extremely flexible because you find that the biggest hindrance to persons being able to get their skills and their products out is that startup. And so mm -hmm. I think that we can do more in terms of helping young people, helping anybody for that matter, not just young people, but enabling mm -hmm. bohemians um, because every dollar that we put into Miami is making America stronger. Right. Whereas we have so many products here, so many individuals here. When we spend our money here, we can do our part in helping to elevate um, the level of governance we have because we're keeping our resources here to help others. Yes. Um, we have a question on the screen, but um, um, folks know, remember um, or know that you can ask your questions on Facebook and YouTube, and they will um, put them before our special guest. But before we get to that question, um, in reference to, to that training and the like, 
So from a new built environment, why we say an intentional new built environment and not just the the normal, the new normal, as they say, which to, to us is just meaning that you buck up and wherever the water flow, you, you do kind of thing. We want it to be intentionally designed in order to create the, the value, the, li the quality of life of everybody to higher levels. So I always had a pet peeve in that um, when I was at the telephone company, businesses always complained that they didn't know or they didn't get the right skill sets coming out of school and the like and so and i always ask them what are you doing to help the schools to be um produce better products for you to put into your business and so your inco um desk is um in that like so you would encourage more businesses or private sector to get involved in various aspects whether helping directly to the schools or creating their own programs or even if it's just funding providing grants to persons like the earth too. That is a part of the in the new built environment that you would like to see happen. And this. mentor, you know, I think I think if we talk about mentorship, and I must I must say that the Ministry of Education and probably private sector schools as well um, have gotten something that they've been doing now for a number of years, where it's called work experience, right. where um, students in I guess tenth through twelfth grade are introduced to businesses for a period of time um, mm -hmm. in areas of interest to them. And, you know, when we talk about education, as we all know, education is not simply about academics. Right. Not everyone is going to be a, um, a Rhodes Scholar, but there is a skill set that everyone has, um, whether they're going to be the best carpenter, the best artist, the best singer. These are all skills that we can... Um, exploit mm -hmm. so that people are able to, uh, if you will, provide for themselves. So getting back to the whole uh, exercise of job experience, I think the schools uh, have started something very positive where students go into the work environment and they're able to get a firsthand um, understanding of those areas of interest to them. If they're not interested in that area, that's a very fine time to know early before you graduate that maybe that is not for me and then you find another avenue. I think that in terms of our education, our formal education, sometimes we miss um, some very good talent in mm -hmm. our schools by not being able to disaggregate those that are more academic as, to, as opposed to those who are more technical. So if we were to look at what government is doing, I think the training center, and we now have a I think we're going to have a dynamic minister of education. Oh, yes. Um, yes. And I think the vocation mm -hmm. and training center also falls under um, Minister Glennis Hannah Martin. Then we have BTVI, which is, you know, can only go from strength to strength if we can mm -hmm. get enrollments and financing of students who may not be able to afford it. Yes, entrepreneurs can do that. Um, and, you know, then the job matching opportunities post graduation. Um, mm -hmm. I was a part of the Hubert Ingram administration where we actually ensured that those students or those persons going on the jobs did not become an expense to those companies' bottom line, but right. the government actually paid you know, the salaries. While it was minimal, it right. was something that could sustain them. So all of these, I think, need to be strengthened, right. need to be examined, and because... Uh, at the end of the day, we still have persons that are going to want to be in our cultural um, arena, whether mm -hmm. it's through the handicraft and straw market, whether it's going to be through the fine arts, whether it's going to be through Junkanoo. All of those things are money-making enterprises that I don't think we fully, fully capitalized on. Right, right. Awesome. So the question that we had on the screen was to do with women um, getting into politics. Um, Madam Producer, you can put it back up for us. And so uh, Kay Cartwright says, and what advice do you have for women who wish to enter politics? Well, I think that's a good question. And one of the things that I've been watching very, very closely is to see what is going to be the percentage of women around the decision-making table mm -hmm. um, in this administration. Uh, as we all know, in the last administration, we've on we only had one, a lone female really, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. around the table. And um, in terms of persons getting into politics, I, I would like to be gender neutral. 
I do understand that it's important that we have full representation, but I do not subscribe to quotas whereby mm -hmm. we say we have to have so many women. Right. What I do subscribe to is people that are able, that have the ability to actually do it. So for women in particular, who may have been shy of going right. into frontline politics, I say, you know, just look at our school system. The majority of our high achievers are women. Mm -hmm. The majority of our voting population are women. The mm -hmm. majority of the heads of our, our homes are women. So mm -hmm. clearly we have leadership skills. I was very pleased to see that on, on all sides of the political divide, whether it was the legacy parties or whether it was the independents, we had a healthy representation mm -hmm. of women going forward. I would also want women to know that because you're a woman, don't think that you have an entitlement to mm -hmm. the table. I want you to come and have your best cap on because believe you me, we are judged at a much higher level than our male counterparts. Mm -hmm. So it's important that you not only have um, factual information behind you, that you're an activist, that you find areas of society that are very, very um, important to you, that you can be passionate about, that will move our country forward. And I think that, you know, the rest of your training, some of it is on the job and some of it is in your community. And a lot of it is in the political organization that you affiliate with. Yeah. And um, y'all are judged um, more stringently or highly because y'all y'all are more special than us, the bottom line, however you want to look at it, right? So I don't know. Uh, you get all the special rights. You you get this, special. You get <laughs> Say it again. It depends on how you interpret that word special. Yeah, well, that's my my way, you know. But uh, no, but seriously, though, we we all um, striving for the same thing. And um, I think as time goes on, the mentality is going to change. Um, and so we'll have more and more and more access for everybody as we go. And, and so I, think as women, I think women and men, we all appreciate that, you know, optimally society works best. Mm -hmm. when we all partner, right. whether it's men and women, whether it's um, society with government, you know, partnerships are very powerful and we must have respect for each side. I think that, you know, also there is this patriarchal type um, thinking in our society. And you said you think that, you know, as time goes on, that will be done away with. Well, I pray that is because truly in order for us to be and reach our fullest potential, we must engage both men and women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as I said in the beginning, um, men and women, people on both sides of the, the, the divide, um, the political divide, people who are rich and poor, who are this ethnic group, the whole thing, we just need to engage the full spectrum of people of the Bahamas, um, or the 242 as I put it, which includes our partners and people who come here and share in our culture. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Right. So what would this administration need in order to achieve raising the people's quality of life? What do you see from your perspective as you walk through, I guess, this is almost 30 years of politics eh, that you walk up well, with. <laughs> yeah, I, I know well, you're only 20, I'm but involved. you know, Involved on the periphery and then um, yes, in yeah. front line. Um, well, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because I've thought I've thought many times about how do we identify quality of life, and mm -hmm. you know, for some people, their identity of quality of life are the material things, the mm -hmm. things like a car, a house, um, you know, those sort of things. While I believe that um, you know the con consumer goods are important, that does not bring real quality of life. Quality of life also must mean that we have a peace of mind, that we're able to um, go to bed at night feeling safe in our country, knowing that you know our security forces are working and that we're not going to um, encounter you know all sorts of crime. Uh, but the Bahamas is a most unique country and a most amazing destination. Uh, the majority of the people live on one of the smallest islands, which is New Providence. Mm -hmm. How do we begin to look at quality of life? Well, you know, my favorite vacation is to vacation within the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. As soon as I land on a family island, 
I feel the fresh air. I look at the beautiful water. I say, wow, now this is real quality of life. How do we elevate that to the citizens that have migrated from their um, indigenous islands? Mm -hmm. Well, the government can begin by ensuring that local government is more effective so that the persons on those islands can make immediate decisions as to be able to ensure that their islands reach a potential where they can attract Bahamians back to those islands. The population on some of these islands has diminished to such an extent that we are not having the full potential. And while visitors appreciate that um, isolation when they go to places like Mayaguana mm -hmm. and Crooked Island and, and Nagua and places like that, I still do, I'm still not sure that Bahamians in our greater numbers right. appreciate how beautiful family island living is. So for me to identify quality of life, it would be able to ensure that we have healthcare systems, that we have reliable transportation, and that we are able to ensure that children on every one of those islands are receiving the same level of education that children are afforded in New Providence. And I believe once we are able to uh, propel our family islands, you will see a dynamic change in the quality of life for most Bahamians. Right, awesome. I see um, the Bishop of Motivation, Diana's last child, is, is tuning in with us this, this evening. And so we encourage you all to ask your questions and, and, and the like, because I mean, we have a lot of brain power in front of us today. He's, he's, he's an awesome motivator. I, he's oh, yeah. one of my favorites. Yes. Actually, he, he, he always told me that I need to, to always upgrade my sound. And so we, we would like to take this opportunity to thank Dom Dev Enterprises and Page Investment uh, Limited because we have upgraded the sound compared to last sessions that we have, the 35 odd shows that we've had before. And so the cell phone airplug mic thing is a, is a done deal. And um, now we're using almost high grade studio quality stuff. I mean, I, I'm not in his isn't bracket that, yet, but. That's amazing. And that's how each each of us helps each other. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so <laughs> Thank we, you, Spence. We appreciate that, Spence, yeah. So before we go to the break, we got two, two short questions we want to ask you here. Um, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the cabinet and the cabinet members as a whole, because that is critical in order to find in what the new built environment would be, that particular entity or structure or instrument, whatever word you want to use of governance. And so we have here um, to complete, we had um, talk about the three things of, of the new built environment, which was the intentional thought um, and actions, the quality of life and sustainability. So this one is on sustainability. How do we ensure the initiatives are sustainable for generations to come, the ones that are going to be implemented now? Well, I, I can't say that I have um, a full perspective on mm -hmm. the initiatives that the government uh, will put forward. Yeah, but whichever but, ones they do, yeah. Okay. How do we make sure that they're sustainable? Well, mm -hmm. first of all, you've got to ensure that people buy into the values of those mm -hmm. initiatives. That, that is the first thing. And so I believe that a vision is only complete until the persons who are going to be a part of that vision fully understand um, your vision and mm -hmm. are able to, to, to um, capture that vision personally. Uh, secondly, uh, it has to also be something that uh, is going to be for the greater good of mm -hmm. the country and the people. And I think therein, um, you know, once those two things are considered and achieved, mm -hmm. I think that they become second nature. They become a part of who we are. And then, of course, they become sustainable over time. Awesome. All right. And before we go to the break, this one which says, how do these vision, mission, uh, values, and behaviors line up um, with the new built environment, the ones that we are expecting based on what was campaigned to be put in place, fixing the COVID um, creating all these different goodies that was in here, the 10-point plans, X, Y, et cetera. How, how do you say those line up? I mean, we don't need to go into details on them, but just generally speaking. I wish I wish I knew what was in the heads of the persons that put together the plan. You might but, know you some know, of that. Let's, let's look 
look at let's let's look at COVID for example. Um, one of the things we saw, I don't know if it was election night or the night after. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was election night where the curfew, for example, was moved to eleven fifty nine p.m. Right. Um, um, I hope that you know in its mandate to listen to the people that we do not throw caution to the wind and mm -hmm. that the government does in fact allow the scientists, the doctors, the experts to give them and uh, uh, inform them right. as to the best way forward with regards to the handling of COVID in terms of personal interactions. One of the things I was very grateful for um, was the fact that it rained so much on election night <laughs> That, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that, you know, people like to gather and celebrate. So mm -hmm. the rain certainly put a damper on that. And people generally, I think, had to go home. Um, the last thing we needed were masses and thousands of people gathering to celebrate this victory. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was a good thing. But I believe that um, we have uh, in the Ministry of Health um, a competent physician and um, I'm glad that it is a physician because um, I, you know, I do not think that the predecessor um, was effective in, in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. And we do need persons that understand when scientists talk to them, uh, what that truly translates to when they're able to impart that information to lay persons. So the government has raised, um, extended the hours before mm -hmm. curfew. And some people may argue that it's reckless. I think that once again, they've got to manage those expectations, ensure that people are still adhering to all of the protocols for gathering and that essentially that we get as many of our individuals vaccinated as possible. Mm, right. In terms of the healthcare system, I was very impressed with what Ecuador has done and I think that the government should really look at what Ecuador has done at quite an inexpensive cost. Ecuador has created beautifully packaged medication and right. vitamins that they give to every one of their citizens mm -hmm. so that they can self-treat or maintain their health while they are at home. So they do mm -hmm. not become a part of the huge numbers of persons that will clog up the healthcare system. I think the government can begin by taking a page out of that because when people have to choose between whether or not they're going to buy sustainable food or whether they're going to buy vitamin um, zinc, vitamin mm -hmm. C, vitamin D, and oh um, I know the ivermectin is probably a little bit controversial, but right. that was also a part of the package that Ecuador gave out in addition to low dose aspirin, which helps with blood clotting and all of those mm -hmm. things that we see happens in COVID. So one of the things I think government should immediately consider is how they can roll out a similar plan to what Ecuador has done so that we can manage the numbers of persons that are um, becoming sick with COVID. Yeah, awesome. Well, that's great. And, um, you know, we, we look at the 12 o'clock one when um, the prime minister did say, the science um, is gonna be driven by the science. And if it was 12 o'clock, for election night, then until the scientists say differently, then that's his logic for continuing on 12 o'clock. So when we come back, we'll touch on the cabinet and where we go from here. So you've been listening to Dale Happy Knowles at something to think about. And we have the lovely uh, Loretta Butler Turner here, who is a wealth of, of knowledge in all spheres of life. And we're pleased to have her here discussing how does the government transition between opposition to to being the driver for the new built environment and so forth. So we'll be right back after these messages. Sammy's Chicken. There's nothing like it. 
by the store, God of 242 Elite. And I just want to tell you all about a uh, great experience crossing Orlando this past month. Uh, we had some fundraisers. We want to thank everyone for reaching out to us. We want to send a special thank you to our coach D and Zell Noel. He really did well taking care of us and looking after us for the past month. Everything that we did, it was awesome. We had really great experience. We played plenty of games, man. Like, we really played a lot of games. We had some scrimmages in there. It felt like I was in school. We wake up every morning for mobility. And after that, we probably go do some ball handling. If not, we have game right after. He's putting in about two, three games a day. We're telling you, we play him about three to four times a week. It was a really great experience. It was well worth it. And I really hope that we continue the ball. I just want to ask anyone that's out there in Freeport, or probably just in the Bahamas, still in school, trying to play ball, build on your skill. Uh, D1 Development is a really great program. You all should try and get out of it. But 242 Elite is a really great traveling program. Welcome back to Something to Think About with Dale Happy Knowles. We're here this evening having a lovely conversation with Loretta Butler-Turner. Dale, Dale, I just want to make a correction or a sure. retraction. Um, it's El Salvador, El Salvador, not Ecuador. It's El okay. Salvador. Yeah, okay. they, 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 they did that medication and vitamin rollout that, mm -hmm. that they're using in their country. Forgive me, please. No problem. I mean, that's what we are all about it. We once we see that we do things that might be not incorrect, then we correct them. There's nothing harm in that. And no, no foul, no cane kind of thing. You know, we play ball and we get bop. Somebody block our shot. We come back and score 20 points on them. Big deal. I mean, but we sometimes in the Bahamas, we take things so personal and this and that and can't do this, can't do that. And we don't roll like that, you know. And Thank, you. Be, Thank you. We good with that. So you're good with me. Um, Yes, and so like we're saying, that we're going to be talking. We're talking about what a new build, a new day's built environment would ought to look like. And so, before we were talking about um, a lot of things, and then we talked about cabinet. We'll be talking about now, and so the cabinet is critical to the government in the Bahamas. Um, the ones who have the executive branch of government because you have three branches of government um, and all equal and sovereign, et cetera. Um, the, the court systems and then parliament that does its piece. But under the executive branch, cabinet is critical in steering the general direction of governance. And so who we put in cabinet makes a significant difference. And so when I look at that, and I look at the cabinet that was announced yesterday, or at least part of it, because there's more um, was being said to come. Um, it seems to me, looking at these names, 
and their skill sets or backgrounds that a lot of intentional thought was put into deciding who's going to sit in these seats. Because a lot of time, it seems like we just throw this one there and throw that one there because we need to put somebody to, to pay them for winning an election for us kind of thing. At least that's the impression we get as outsiders. And you have been sitting in the seat. What are some of the kind of things that goes behind when a cabinet is being built that people have to consider? Well, I was, you know, it was interesting that when I went to the swearing in um, ceremony for the prime minister and the deputy prime minister on Saturday past, mm -hmm. I was speaking with um, an esteemed individual who told me uh, that he was a part of the prime minister's transition team. Okay. I found that to be very interesting because, you know, very often we see where persons are elevated to high office and they are just, they seem to be automatically imbued with all knowing, all knowledge. And, you know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. they probably do not consult. So I didn't ask who else was on the transition team, but I was just very happy to hear that there is a transition team. And one of the things that um, stood out to me is maybe this transition team is helping to look at the skill sets of those persons that were elected to try and align them with the best suited portfolio. Mm -hmm. But also having said that, uh, I think one of the most difficult decisions for a government uh, or a prime minister is to have such a huge victory. Mm -hmm. because everybody obviously has been to war mm -hmm. and they've now come from the war victorious. And if you can refer to a cabinet posting as the purple medal mm -hmm. for heroism, then everybody wants a purple medal. Right. But just as judiciously as they carried out their campaign, they've got to realize that not everyone is going to be the general not everyone's going to be a lieutenant. Not everyone's going to be at the same level because it takes so many levels to make the government um, work. Mm -hmm. And a backbench position, while it may not optimally be what those individuals would want um, out of the gate, good performance is never overlooked. Mm -hmm. And at some point, if the government is successful, then there's always room for ascension. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the skill sets thus far because of the transition team, and I guess also to the fact that the prime minister is trying to, or appears to be one that is consulting widely. Um, I'm very pleased with the, the choices made thus far. We see already that there were two key positions where they went outside of the elected MPs. Right. Uh, one mm -hmm. of those would have been a very important and key position, the attorney general's role. Mm -hmm. And the other one would be the minister of state for finance. Mm -hmm. um, those are those are going to be very important roles. They're always very important roles. Um, and so sometimes the skill sets may not be built in or, you know, the working relationship may not be inherent in the the people that were actually elected. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think all of those things people need to consider. I, I also do not want to see tomorrow that we have a hugely bloated um, cabinet, mm -hmm. which is going to be an onerous expense on the public purse. Mm -hmm. And so I want to see probably um, some alignments of some of the portfolios so that we don't have to especially given during all of the financial challenges right. we have, um, you know, all of these persons with their aides, their cars, their secretaries, mm -hmm. their this and that, that we all have to pay for. So I'm hoping that they will be judicious in that as well, but not, you know, overlooking the importance of having key persons around the cabinet table that will be able to still do an effective job. Right. Well, um, and there's a question here, but we're going to get two seconds, but the, you somebody or you mentioned that how many women would be in the um, around the table. Um, my prediction is that there's only going to be three more announcements for oh, okay. additional cabinet members, right? Okay. This is, I guess, this is my wish or hope or whatever, but it, I shouldn't call it a prediction. Uh, the three of them are going to be women, 
And I think people are going to be surprised as to who just analyzing the names on this paper for cabinet and the scope and the skills and the like. I think it's going to just be three women. And I say that to say because people believe that if you have the talent and the skills to get elected, that that's the same talent and skills that you need to govern. And they don't necessarily line up to be the same. And so when I look at who is left in the mix, and then we talk about the governance side and who is ready to govern today. And as my coach used to say, when I wanted to play second base ahead of two guys, you will have your time. Uh, sit close to me and learn and absorb everything you could absorb and be ready so when I call, you can deliver on what I call you to do. And that's Absolutely. what I encourage all backbenchers to do. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree with you. And, you know, yeah. even in our democracy, while people may not consider that um, being a backbencher is important, in the proper Westminster system, backbenchers are very, very important. You mm -hmm. see, when you sit at the executive level and you 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 clearly delineated um, the three um, arms of governance, and I will add mm -hmm. a fourth to that, you spoke about the executive, the judiciary, and the legislative. Right. Um, while the other, which I would like to add, is not an elected position, I also want to talk about the fourth estate, um, mm -hmm. the, the media, which is very important in helping to keep everything balanced. Mm -hmm. But I think that when you look at the backbenchers, they, by not sitting in cabinet, they do not enjoy that collective responsibility that one must take when a policy decision is made. Mm -hmm. So when they stand on their feet to represent their constituents and the, the wider Bahamian population in debate in parliament, they can be objective. Mm -hmm. um, they may even disagree with a policy, but this is where the Westminster system is most effective Mm -hmm. when you have strong opposition members and when you have strong backbenchers that are able to speak freely on those things that represent the people they are there to represent. Right. Awesome. So the question, oh, I see the question has changed now. You say, okay, watching from Freeport, Grand Bahama, Sonia Longley, and she says she believes it takes a humi humility and willingness to learn from the cabinet minister to be successful in their role. The financial and situation of the country has to be taken into account. Do you believe the downgrade by Moody's will cause this new government to be conservative in its spending? Well, I think that's where the expectations, that's a very good question, Ms. Longley. They're going to have to be conservative. First of all, they have to, immediately get a grasp on what is going on in the Ministry of Finance and all of mm -hmm. the other ministries to ensure, because we still have now, if you look at it, we still have approximately five months to our next budget. Is it five? Okay. Mm -hmm. Four? Da, 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 da. No, we have more than that. More than we that. actually have about nine months mm -hmm. to our next budget. And so that means the monies that are there are already budgeted. We don't want to see that after the first sitting of parliament, that some bill is going to come like we did in the last administration to borrow money when mm -hmm. we are on the precipice of having, you know, serious financial repercussions. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have to be conservative. And that is why I don't think they should begin with a very bloated cabinet. Right. Yes, they're going to have to lead by example, because if you're going to ask the citizens to tighten their belts, well, then show me that you are leading from the front and that mm -hmm. you're not going to be reckless in how you're spending our money. Because mm -hmm. the only way that I'm going to be conservative is if you're going to be conservative, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, and mm -hmm. all of the other ministers. Yeah. Um, we also want to see that, you know, we're not saying that they do not have to travel to do um, our country's business, but we don't want to see entourages of, you know, right. delegations, <coughs> excuse me, going away on the taxpayer's mm -hmm. expenditure. And those are things they can be very conservative with. What they cannot be conservative with, excuse me, mm -hmm. <coughs> at this time, is to ensure that our healthcare system is immediately reinforced. Right. The health of a nation is the wealth of a nation. 
if we do not have healthy citizens, if we do not have a healthy environment to keep our citizens healthy, then of course we're not going to be able to grow our wealth. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. So while we're going to be conservative or we're hoping they will be conservative, that we see the money going to the direct um, improvement of our society through health, through education, and through those things that we can immediately start to get dividends on. Yes. And so we look at what Loren McDonald is asking here, right? <laughs> and we say that we were taught that leaders are readers. And so my question would be to cabinet members, what books are they reading? And so Loren is asking you, what book are you reading at this point in time? I'm actually revisiting two books. Um, one of them by um, uh, the lady who previously was on Facebook. It's called Lean In. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very important um, book for people of both sexes, male and female, to read because okay. it actually speaks to um, how women uh, operate and how they're accepted in governance, in the corporate world, in leadership roles. So I'm doing that. And then there's another interesting one that I think every politician should read. I'm not a chess player, but I okay. do believe that this book is very important, The Art of War. Mm. Very, very, oh, very, no, very, very, that book. very yeah. good book. So sometimes I keep I keep a stack of books beside my bed. Mm -hmm. um, I also read um, current uh, current articles, but I think it's always important sometimes when you have read certain books that you're able to go back to them to refresh your memory as well. And mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm 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 revisiting both of those books. Awesome. And so when we look at the cabinet now we have the the honorable prime minister um who has the ministry of i think it was with finance and yeah finance um, then you have um the deputy lead um prime minister who has tourism aviation and investment which i find to be an interesting combination then you have um the Honorable um, Leo Ryan Pinder, who is the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, and he is a senator. Um, he he has a strong tax background, and people were talking about why he versus somebody like a Raymond Rowe or the rest who are really criminal background or, I guess, practicing courtroom type legal lawyers. You 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 uh, an attorney. Um, legal mind, etc. Um, my understanding or my recollection of the situation is that the biggest issue I think the government of Bahamas is going to have to face from our legal point of view over the next five years is tax reform. And that's why I'm thinking that that might have been the mindset behind uh, Mr. Pinder being made the Attorney General. Well, even in his life as a frontline politician, Ryan Pinder has always been the one who has, you know, discussed issues as it relates to taxes. Okay. Um, also, you know, you understand that there are a lot of international treaties that the Bahamas has signed on to right. for tax exchanges and um, tax evasion and all of that. So <clears throat> I... I believe that you're absolutely correct in your reasoning as to why um, he would have been made the attorney general, but they also have a very competent young man, I'm told, as the um, uh, Jomo Campbell. Jomo um, Campbell, yes. Mm -hmm. His position in the ministry would be... Uh, um, Minister of State. Legal Affairs. Um, legal legal affairs. affairs, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, between both of them, we will have those bases covered. Wayne Monroe is obviously a very, very strong criminal um, defense attorney. Right. Uh, that was a really good match for national security because I think one of the biggest challenges that we have in our country are proper case management, case okay. preparation, especially mm -hmm. from the perspective of the prosecution's department. And so how would Wayne... And, and, and this is here is where the synergy and the partnership, I think, is going to work. A mm -hmm. Wayne Monroe to ensure that the police department, the prosecutors that come out of the police department are well prepared, right. that their cases are, you know, done properly. Because if we're looking to ensure that there are cases that are successful, 
you're going to have to have proper preparation. So um, I, 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 I think I like that mix. I like that a mm-hmm. whole lot because you get you get Ryan Pinder, who's strong on tax background. You have Jomo Campbell, who apparently is very good um, with legal administration. And okay. then you have um, a defense attorney who would be looking at the prosecution from the perspective that as a defense attorney, where he probably blew a lot of holes into the prosecution because right. he's had a very successful run. So mm-hmm. it seems like it's a very, um, on paper, it seems to be a very good mix, in my opinion. Yes, yes, very much so. And I think the, the, the one on the outside who normally seems to win all of the cases against the government might have little challenges now. On the one front. <laughs> yeah. And so we go on now and then we have some more of the wisdom side of, of, of the cabinet. Um, because I say it is wisdom and energy, the, the elders and the youth. And so we have the Honorable Fred Mitchell, who is to me the esteemed foreign affairs and public servants person, um, filling that role. And we have the Honorable Glennis um, Hannah Martin, who I think is the, the, the tiger of all in the House of Assembly. Um, she has now education, um, technical and vocational training. And I think that is critical because she's a listener, as I know her. And the cry throughout the whole of the last four years or so has been, um, particularly from the unions, is that nobody's listening or nobody's respecting and nobody's caring. And my my observance of Mrs. Hannah Martin in the House, etc., is that she listens and then she, when need be, she will attack. And so I don't know what your thoughts are on those two in the um, cabinet positions. Um, well, Fred Mitchell, uh, I listened to the prime minister when he presented him yesterday. And mm-hmm. he said one of his key roles is going to ensure that he um, reaches out to our international partners Um, here again, to work closely with the Ministry of Health to ensure that we not only have enough vaccinations, but whatever skill sets we need, that Fred Mitchell will be able to reach out to those counterparts to secure those things for the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. So if that is high on his agenda, then I believe that that would be a good mix. Um, In terms of education, I am very delighted to see that Mrs. Hannah Martin is actually uh, moving from uh, the two portfolio, the portfolio she held on two previous occasions, mm-hmm. and that she is going into education. Um, hopefully, that uh, she, as you've correctly stated, she is a listener. Um, she is of the people. She is a mother, and I believe a grandmother as well. Uh, she understands the importance of education. She has children who are very high achievers. So obviously, she realizes the importance of education. And I think that, you know, having um, a woman there, I remember uh, Dame Ivy Dumont, who was an excellent administrator, actually uh, was excellent in education. I think that, you know, a woman in education is is a very good thing. Um, you know, as children, even us, you know, when we had to do homework, who was it around the dinner table with mm-hmm. us? Our mm-hmm. mother, yeah. our mother. And so, you know, that, that I think... Um, I'd love to see how she handles that. And I think she'll be successful. And mm-hmm. I pray that she is successful. Yes, very good. And so we, we go down the line now, and we also have the Honorable Alfred Says, Minister of Works and Utilities. Uh, I think that one's going to be interesting. Um, not saying he doesn't have, because I, I, I respect him highly as a person and, and the ability to methodically chop down or dissect or whatever you and then come back with um, wise um, counsel and then and then um, Michael the Honorable Michael Dr. Michael uh, Dowell the Ministry of Health and Wellness those two I like the fact that it's health and wellness I love I love that new um, name for that ministry because obviously one of and, and I'm dealing with the second one first mm-hmm. forgive yeah. me um, I, I think that we sometimes overlook that we've got to be proactive in our health right. um, in terms of being um, citizens that are well. So I'm hoping there is an emphasis on wellness. I'm glad that it's now included in that ministry's name. Um, with regards to the Honorable Alfred Sayers in the Ministry of Works, that is the largest allocation of funds in any portfolio mm-hmm. um, ministry of works because of course it requires infrastructure it, it, it covers um, 
water and sewerage, it covers BPL and all of those. Mm -hmm. Each of those are at very um, crucial points where you realize that you're going to need a legal mind as well that is able to go through all of the various contracts. I think BPL, if we can use that as an example, is a fine is a fine institution where you're going to need a minister that understands all the legal jargon with regards mm. to BPL. Are we going to transition into um, non-fossil fuels? Are we going to have um, contracts finally resol resolved mm -hmm. with regard? BPL has been um, up and down. We've had so many promises with regards to what was going to happen. This didn't happen. I think that's very good. Ministry of Works, once again, requires the infrastructure of all of our islands. We are an archipelagical um, country mm -hmm. and there are infrastructural um, programs that need to be done in so many of our islands. Uh, the technocrats will deal with all of the things that are needed with regards to that infrastructure, but he's going to also be able to look at those legal contracts to ensure that they are in the best interest of the Bahamian people. So once again, he's got the experience. He's been a cabinet minister for, um, I guess, two two terms previously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he understands what is needed. Uh, I'm sure there will be somebody else uh, assigned. I'm saying sure because it's a huge ministry. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe and I do hope that there will be someone else assigned maybe at the level of Parl Sect or um, okay. Minister of mm -hmm. State that will be able to assist in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so... As we look to this question on the screen, one thing before we do that would be, is that we also need to uh, state that a lot of what the minister is responsible for is policy and then ensuring that the policy of government is actually translated um, correctly when we get down to the permanent secretaries and the like, who are the ones who are actually executors and the strategists, et cetera, for all of these they're things. The ones, so, they're the ones that make government work. Yes. As they as they tell us, you know, we're permanent. You guys are transient. <laughs> hey, I like to imagine one or two of them will say that in, um, in open forum. Uh, so Maxine Johnson Stubbs um, says here, as a former minister of um, social services, which I think is still to be appointed, um, who do you feel would be the good choice in this new government? Mm. That's one, of the yeah, one, one of the things I would like to um, see is I, I do not know all of the skill sets of the candidates. I, you know, I really during this campaign, I've got to be very honest with you. It's the first time in many, many years that I have not been actively involved in, in, mm -hmm. in a campaign. Um, but I can speak to the characteristics of what I'd like to see. Right. I don't know who those individuals are that will fit those characteristics. First of all, it doesn't have to be stereotypical. In other words, you know, we tend to think that, you know, these, um, as we call them, soft ministries should be for women. Um, it can be a male or a female. It doesn't matter. But I know one thing what we do not want to see is a minister who does not fully grasp the great need um, in our society mm -hmm. and the empathy that is needed for individuals. I also want love to see a minister who understands the plight of the practitioners in social mm -hmm. services. Uh, their social work, um, I think there's a very high level of burnout in social work. So when they're carrying out their policies, I hope that there is more that can be done because the minister is not able to do these things. As you've correctly stated, it is the technocrats that do them. So they have got to be very empathetic Mm -hmm. They have also got to make sure there is greater um, accountability in how the resources of the state are dispersed to persons that actually need them. There are a lot of loopholes, I can tell you from my experience, where we have seen abuses in the system um, by persons who should not be getting um, social assistance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, getting it. And then, of course, you know, social services is also, I think, now social development. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole gamut there as it relates to young people mm -hmm. and, you know, crimes against young people, um, incest and sexual sexual um, mm -hmm. um, misconduct against young people. So you've got to have also be a very confidential person that is able to administer and set policies 
that your practitioners will be able to follow very clearly. Yes, and so you said that it's traditionally considered to be one of the lower ministries, but in my mind, when we look at um, governance, we normally think of social, economic, and, um, and um, um, social, political, right? So I think social services is really, should be one of the prominent ones because it deals specifically with people and it's the people who we're governing for. So, and it's the people who need the assistance, uh, not necessarily as we saw with COVID, that is not just the bottom rung, if you want to call it that, um, but everybody. Um, and which Dr. Sands used to tell me was that our issue with medical challenges is huge, but we don't really promote it. So, you know, there's a wealth of people issues that needs to be addressed. And to me, that's a big one. Um, I will say, you know, go ahead. I, you know, one of, I think it's one of your sponsors, um, if I can, um, is one of your sponsors, one of the accounting firms? Um, anyway. Yeah, whether, well, one of the members of an accounting firm, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so one of the things that that particular individual spearheaded when I was the Minister of Health Yes. and funded, which mm -hmm. I think, when I was the Minister of Social Development, I'm sorry, was um, the um, hotline. Right. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people were going through mental issues and we had seen a slight increase in suicides and suicide attempts. And social development encompasses all of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's those sort of programs, you know, that we sometimes overlook. Um, the, the mental health of our people and you know how do we uh, actually prevent that as opposed to having to um, endure that? So I think that even partnerships with such individuals, um, I won't call his name, but I know you know who I'm talking about, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that they promote. And I think that that minister, like you said, they hold a lot of power. I didn't say it was a low rung um, ministry. What I said, it's a soft ministry. Soft ministry. That's, 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 yeah. that's, mm -hmm. that's how they refer to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, when they think soft, they think emotion, they think women. But right. I have seen men um, in roles of uh, women equality being just mm -hmm. as passionate as women. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I said I didn't want it to be gender driven. It mm -hmm. has to be more characteristic driven and skill set driven. Um, and you have rightly said ministers are the policy makers. They're not the practitioners. And I think that uh, as long as we understand that our policies have got to be clear, then, of course, our, our, our line staff will understand what it is we want to achieve. Yeah. Well, if there's one person who to me, uh, and I don't know the person well, um, other than to see them on the TV and the dike and stuff that I think always popped out when, when, when we go into what we call these mock cabinets, right? And people sit around the table and say, who should be this? Who should be that? And stuff. Like that. And that's um, um, be a global role and seems to just fit to somebody who is needed, who has the, the vibe of what is needed for this position at this point in time. Whether it happens or not, I don't know. I right. don't know. Was, I, you know, I, 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 I must commend. Um, I think it's seven women that were elected. Yes, I must commend that. all of them because it seems like they all have, you know, great talent. Mm -hmm. And you know, whoever the prime minister determines is going to sit around the cabinet with him today, tomorrow. I just want them to be encouraged that they have a role, and people pay attention, whatever mm -hmm. that role is. And once you do the best that you can do in that role as an MP, which is your first commitment, you will in fact understand that at some point you will also be elevated. But right now, the mm -hmm. most important thing is to be a good representative and servant of the people. Right. And one of the things is that people believe that those positions are permanent. They, they all say what the will and wish of the prime minister. So in cabinet. So if you to win a straight, then you give him reason to move you and so forth. And some people just Absolutely. move in order to get more energy or more training. Absolutely. Uh, I shouldn't say training, that's not the word I'm looking for, but I think you know what I mean. More exposure. Yes, exposure. Higher, higher mm -hmm. offices. So if we, there was a question, Ms. Madam Producer, um, I don't know if you still have it there, but 
if we continue to look down this list of cabinet mem members, um, the I think we mentioned health and um, oh, the Senator Michael, um, Honorable Michael uh, Halkidis, Minister of Ed and Minister of Economic Affairs and the leader of government business in the Senate. Is that the same thing as the president of the Senate or is that different? No, 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 no. The president of the Senate is uh, the person who sits in the seat, like the Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, that means that he is going to be the head government senator. That's what that means. He's going to be the lead senator okay. for the government mm -hmm. side. Yeah, like, like Mitchell was before and Carl Atholetti. Exactly, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, so those, those you have um, he and then you also have, um, I call him Mr. Percival, um, Mr. the Honorable Clay Sweeten, who was Minister of Agriculture, um, Marine Resources and Family Island Affairs. What's your thoughts on those two? Well, I just learned that he has had a wealth of experience in local government, which I think is great because apparently he was elected at a very early age. He comes from a very industrious island, mm -hmm. one of our very um, our fishing islands, um, Spanish Wells. Um, I imagine that he certainly can bring to the table a wealth of experience with regards to family island development um, mm -hmm. and all of the challenges inherent in the family island. So once again, um, on the face of it, mm -hmm. uh, I think that he is a good fit. And you s alluded to this earlier that, you know, in practice is when people truly see what right. your true characteristics are like. So I, I, I think it's way too early for us to determine whether or not any of these persons will be successful. We can only say that, you know, on on the face of it, right. uh, that they appear to be good fits. And so with him, I would say that. Uh, they're going to have a little time uh, to start to prove themselves. And yeah. then they're going to have the fuller time of five years to determine if they're successful. Um, the people ultimately will give them a verdict at the end of their, their um, tenure. Mm -hmm. But at this time, They've got to realize that with the level of um, technology that we have today, anything that they do, anything that they do not do, is mm -hmm. known within a nanosecond. Mm -hmm. So they have got to be very careful what they say, what they do, and how they proceed in governance. So I'm hoping that uh, all of these individuals, while seemingly well-selected, uh, will now translate into being um, very productive and working for the people. You know, Coach Ron Frazier used to tell us, um, or at least he used to tell me that, you know, Knowles, if, if you focus on hitting that fastball on the outside corner, um, the left field, and don't worry about the curveball and the rest of those things, you would be successful nine out of 10 times. And so if they were to do the same thing and focus on what they know they do best in the house and don't get caught up in all these other stuff that go around, I would I think that any person there should be able to do so, be successful. I, and I fully agree with you. And, you know, that they continue to realize that they are not our rulers. Mm -hmm. They are our employees. Right. Yes. And then we have the, the two, we spoke of one already, um, um, Honorable Jomo um, Campbell. He was a senator before, right? I think. Was, did I mix it? Anyway, no, Sastrum, I'll sorry. So um, he is the Minister of State of Legal Affairs who will um, be the Robin of, of, or the wingman of the um, Attorney General. And then you have the Honorable Wayne Monroe, QC, who is uh, Minister of National Security. Now, Minister of National Security, um, people seem to hold that position as very high. In, in our system of governance. And then they say you put a, a, a lawyer because we seem to be getting to the point where everybody seems to think a technocrat in the field needs to be the one who is holding these positions. Like when um, Dr. Sands or Dr. Menace was in health, we said, okay, because they are doctors, that's the right fit. And we had people like Carlton Francis and People, everybody who, who might not have been anything to do with that sphere of, of discipline, 
but they had the attributes in order to be able to govern or to oversee and lead and manage or lead people and manage systems and things. And administrators, so, good administrators, administrators and legislators. Right. That's important. Right. Um, with regards to Monroe, I think we touched on that earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in terms of administration, he can certainly strengthen that. Um, national security is a very huge ministry in terms of our uniformed branches. It covers mm -hmm. everything from the defense force, the police force, the prison systems. Um, and, you know, it is important because um, if we don't have a safe environment or people do not feel that we have mm -hmm. a safe environment, not only will citizens live in fear, but you, you see the United States is very, very quick and they're our biggest um, catchment um, country in terms of right. tourism. They're very, very quick to put out um, advisories to their citizens to say either avoid the Bahamas or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it is a very important ministry. I think that, you know, once again, he, you know, the partnerships and the synergy between the ministries are going to have to be effective. You have Clay Saunders in agriculture. You know the challenges we have with the Dominican fishermen. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to make sure that our defense forces are up to par and that our boats are out there and our mm -hmm. men are well and our women and, uh, and the Defense Force are able to protect our borders um, on the outside and that our police officers on the inside are able to de keep internal peace and that, you know, the prison systems are effective. So I think that he's got his work cut out for him. Um, we have a lot of um, gang related violence going on in our communities. Uh, and while people say that those are limited to gangs, Believe it or not, it affects all of us. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, Monroe uh, probably would be able to, while he's not a practitioner of nat national right. um, uh, security, um, I believe that he can bring a perspective that can administer um, effective practicing in national security. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. So um, you, you've heard, uh, well, I read about the Turner's perspective more so than mine, but uh, I added some flavor to it. But uh, tell us what you think about that cabinet and the like, and um, on anything else you have on the table that you want to address that we have discussed or something that we might not have discussed. Um, post your questions in, in, the, in the chat, and then we will endeavor to answer those in these last couple of minutes before we, we uh, take our leave for the evening. Because I mean, we still have COVID, um, not COVID, come curfew at some time that's going to kick in. It might be a little later, but it's still curfew, right? So when we look at, at this whole big picture now, uh, and we talked earlier about the people of the Bahamas want to participate in our system of governance, and they don't want to be spectators anymore. Um, in my day, or more your day, I guess, um, we've abdicated the power of the people to the parliament and the politicians, and now the people want it back. They want to be able to be involved more on a day-to-day -day basis. So the question we have here would be, what ought the new built environment interface for the people need to look like in order for us to have an efficient government? You know, one of, one of the yeah. things that stood out to me, um, Happy, is the previous, previous administration said mm -hmm. that they would strengthen local government. Mm -hmm. And I always I always say, you know, if the United States of America had to wait for Washington to okay everything that happened in Florida, nothing will ever happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So having said that, um, one of the things that this administration, I don't know if it's articulated in their blueprint or not, but one of the things that we can do is to um, ease the control that central government has mm -hmm. over so many areas. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have created systems where uh, the prime ministers, the ministers, they love the fact that, that people have to come <laughs> and approach uh, to say, can we get this done? Can we get that done? But I think effective government also also means being able to delegate mm -hmm. and being able to allow people to have a greater say. I live I live in the new northeastern um, 
district of New Providence. Okay. New Providence is a relatively small island with a high population. Uh, there are many things that central government may or may not have to be directly involved in. Um, the previous administration promised that we were going to have local government in New Providence. Mm -hmm. I think that this can help to alleviate a lot of the um, demands that are placed on members of parliament because you mm -hmm. start getting the community involved because who knows better what a community needs than the community residents mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be that would be a great way, I think, um, of being able to be more effective. I think that there was a lot of grab back with re with regards to local government, even in the family islands. When I say grab back, um, in terms of the powers and the funds that were returned to those islands, um, certainly if we can use Abaco as an example, you know, Abaco is a huge revenue um, earner for the public treasury of the Bahamas, but yet their returns to their island for their local government development was in proportion um, it much less than what they got so that they can do projects. And Abaco uh, obviously, you know, can use that sort of impetus, I believe. So I think that if government, um, while laying out their policies, they need to strengthen these other arms of government to be more autonomous mm -hmm. uh, so that people um, generally can have more say over their everyday lives and then they can deal with the macroeconomics and the macro um, infrastructure of our country, as opposed to all of the minor things. Right. You know, and on that point, um, when when I was um, in the system and we were building out all the cell sites on the upper coast, we had to interface with local government there. And part of the challenge there was that you never knew where to locate the interface there compared to Nassau between central governance and, and different people were pointing you to, to okay, you got to go back to Abaco and then when you get to Abaco, you reach a certain point and you come back to Nassau and that backward and forward and happened and caused and a knew. project that should have taken maybe three months, four months to do almost a year and a half. Right? So what you're losing are two things that are important. You're losing time, which is money, mm -hmm. and you're losing money because you're not getting your project completed on time. Right. And mm -hmm. that is why I think it's most important that, you know, there's a strengthening of local government, municipal government, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. It's got to be um, strengthened. And as I said, I do not know if that is a part of the PLP's um, blueprint, mm -hmm. uh, but it's certainly it's certainly going to be interesting. Um, have they appointed a ministry yet for local government? I think it's Family Island Affairs. I think it's Family Island Affairs. Is, is, is that clay? Is that clay? That's something. That's some clay. Yeah. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. that's going to be very important. Um, and he has come up being a local government practitioner, so I think he understands all of the um, challenges that entails. Mm -hmm. So we've got to ensure that all of these islands and all of these communities, even in New Providence are mm -hmm. able to be more autonomous. And doesn't that make life easier for our policymakers, I would think, so that they can then concentrate on the big things that are so pressing? Mm -hmm. I think that would make sense. I mean, just yeah. my thoughts. Yeah, that, that is very good. Um, and I think what is what is inside the, the documents is the actual digital transformation of a lot of these things. And so with digital, you, you, you extend the reach of people and the like. And so if the, the government is already in place, then a lot of the efficiencies or inefficiencies that exist today can easily drop away and become more efficient in the process, which will help do that. So we have, um, sorry, you can say? No, and it's funny you should say that because you know we are always um, perplexed about our court system. My husband being a lawyer mm -hmm. told me that COVID created one of the most effective environments for cases now because you know, a lot of their cases are done via Zoom. And of course, it's all done electronically and cases have moved more rapidly. So I'm glad you mentioned, mentioned the digitalization of, of certain things because yes, you're absolutely right. That makes a lot of the back and forth um, redundant. Right, right. So Sonia Longley has a, a follow-up, I guess, to, which says, does Mrs. Turner miss frontline politics and does she have a a mentorship program for the youth women who want to enter. Mrs. Turner also the wealth of knowledge that she can impart 
for us to grow this country in an ordinary manner? Um, no, I don't have a mentorship program. And I got to tell you a lot of, well, not a lot, but a few persons had reached out to me. And you know, one of the questions that I asked everyone that reached out to me, hmm. I, asked, I wanted to know a bit more about them because I think there are certain things that are, how do you put it? Um, some things are inherent mm -hmm. and some things are learned. And so I wanted to know where these individuals were at right. in terms of what was driving them to get into frontline politics. Mm -hmm. And very few of them ever responded to me because mm -hmm. before I take on any type of mentorship, I really want to know what am I dealing with? What are your, what are your values? What are your principles? Mm -hmm. Because, um, I think that, uh, some of it, like I said, um, is learned, and then you know the rest of it is right. learned. So no, I don't have a mentorship program. Yeah, but you, you still um, um, participate through boards and the like of things like the in in um, in like Qdesk and I also and like, right? I'm on several boards which I enjoy um, mm -hmm. because I think that. I think that one of the things at this stage of my life is I'm more wanting to see how I can help to contribute positively to my country mm -hmm. as opposed to being, um, well, you know, my last stint in politics, I was an independent. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've more or less uh, moved away from the um, partisan mm -hmm. politics and realized that, you know, even bigger than that is to just be a Bahamian. Right, right. And that's why I said at the beginning, I couldn't see anybody more suited to do this discussion because you've been on all sides of the fence. No, all three sides. So kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, it, it does it does a lot if, if if people still follow you because you know leaders are people who people will follow even when they don't have a title or position or, or authority. And there's a lot of people out there who still call your name. So well, thank you, you. you've done something. Yeah, and um, I think that if we all did our part, you know, we can we can contribute in a positive way. So I'm just doing my part. That's all I'm doing. Yeah, a good part to do. Um, so when we look at it collectively and individually, this cabinet now, then we ask the question, are there any glaring concerns that this cabinet um, that might hinder the implementation, say specifically COVID, the economy, and unifying the country. Is there any glaring thing that is is surfacing that I know is early, but that is not being addressed or not seem to be addressed, even though the cabinet isn't complete, that will help it move forward? That's just a question we have to ask. I mean, we can ask all the good ones. I think it's a bit early. Mm -hmm. um, really to, to make that determination. I think you said tomorrow we're going to see the finalization. I agree that, okay. I agree that it should um, be tomorrow, another set, but I don't know. I haven't seen okay. anything. So, um, let me not, let me not preempt what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's early yet. Um, I just think that the most, the most important thing is that I've listened very intently Mm -hmm. to the speeches given by both the prime minister and the deputy prime minister. And um, I think they've said all the right things, but you know, speech writers, they know what to say. Oh yeah. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, 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 I trust that those are convictions mm -hmm. and that those are truly um, the goals that they are setting for themselves because pretty words will only last for so long. Yeah. Uh, we have a low tolerance level, I said right now, for um, delivery mm -hmm. uh, because there are a lot of people hurting. Uh, so basically, let me let me give them. I'm not going to give them a long honeymoon. They're not right. going to have six months. Right. I'm sorry. You said you're going to be ready on day one. Well, mm -hmm. now you've got it. You mm -hmm. know that we have huge challenges. Let mm -hmm. us pray that you demonstrate you are ready. Um, I imagine cabinet would have met today. So there are certain things they would have already started um, putting in in motion. Mm -hmm. um, let's give them a few months and see how they go. But mm -hmm. by the same token, I expect the opposition, as much as they are in disarray, they represent 
a portion of our people and government is made up of more than just cabinet ministers. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, opposition is also a part of government. I want to see what they're going to do. Yeah, you, you lead me into my last question, but uh, <laughs> I, won't, I won't go there yet. Um, mm -hmm. So um, my mom always used to say, if, in reference to what you just said, that you always have to listen to what people say, listen to what they don't say, and read their body language. And so if you could do the three of those things, then, then you should get a good feel as to what's going to happen from the, that person um, in the long run. And so before we get on to that question about the opposition, uh, maybe we take that one first. Let's, let's just do that one. We, are, we know that they got the same whammy um, cowboy slap that the government of the day got four, four years ago. So they're going to take a little bit to recoup. Um, this particular prime minister has said that he's going to operate from day one. And so far, he has been doing it from day one. The question is, what, how long it's going to take for this opposition to be able to catch himself and become a viable opposition? Boy, it can take a lot of catching for them, I could tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I'm, I'm not saying that in jest. I'm saying that mm -hmm. from experience. I mm -hmm. mean, I can tell you that um, the leader of what is now the official opposition, mm -hmm. um, he's not a good listener. Um, I trust that this lesson is one that would have um, made him realize the era of many missteps. Uh, I wish them well mm -hmm. because they do represent um, mm -hmm. a large portion of our electorate. And it is their job to ensure mm -hmm. that the government is held accountable. Mm -hmm. I remember when um, we were opposition in 2012 to 2017, the question was put to me, how effective can such a small opposition be against, um, you know, uh, such a huge majority? Mm -hmm. And I vowed that very same day to one of the, the, the reporters, I said, let me tell you, I'm not worried about the numbers of us. I am only worried about us being there and representing, and I get do my part to represent. I think every opposition member now needs to realize that they've been taught a lesson because, you know, Bahamians, we teach you a lesson through our mm -hmm. vote. Mm -hmm. They've been taught um, a, a very serious lesson and that they go away now, um, repent, and then get to action. I don't know how long it's going to take them to regroup. Mm -hmm. That's their internal business. Mm -hmm. um, I am um, not a part of that. and uh, But I can only pray that mm -hmm. they do it quickly because without a strong opposition, right. we will have a tendency to have go a government that mm -hmm. feels it can do anything that it wants to do. Right. And that was what I was just about to ask you. Well, you, you might not be able to say when they would, but the question would be, how long do we have as the people to allow them to be in their wilderness state and not be it's effective? The same way we expect the government to be mm -hmm. running out of the blocks. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, sometimes you have to nurse some wounds and everything. Okay, I'll give them a little bit extra time. Mm -hmm. um, they get a little bit more honeymoon than the government. But at the end of the day, um, I think it's October the 6th that the house re-meets or, you know, that they're going Somewhere to have the, mm -hmm. the, the ceremonial thing. I expect that whenever they meet in business again in the parliament, mm -hmm. I expect those um, those government officials not only to be answerable to their actions that they did or did not do in governance, mm -hmm. but to be able to articulate why they did or did not do what they did and to be able to make sure that this administration is going to be accountable. That's the best that I can hope for for them. All right. Sounds sounds good. I won't put you on the spot to ask you about the individual people in there. That's seven. But um, let's uh, do this final one, and then I'll give you the opportunity to say what you want to say to the general public, which is to tell us um, what ought to be realistic the, that we should, the people should look forward in this first 100 years, 100, 100 days. We seem to like this, I guess, this American talk about 100 day um, stuff where we got to do so much in 100 days. And that's supposed to be a measure of the whole period. I, I don't subscribe to that. No, but. 
Well, I think I think the hundred days basically is what they refer to as that honeymoon period, eh? Mm. Um, when yeah, people, yeah, sort of, sort of long honeymoon period. Um, there's a lot of legislation that needs to be dealt with. Um, first and foremost, they've got to be able to look at the executive orders to make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, that those are either carried forward or they're done away with. Um, that is very important. I think within the first hundred days, we've also got to hear very clearly what the government's um, plans are with regards, because COVID to me mm -hmm. and the healthcare system, even though I know the financial system is also in free fall, mm -hmm. the healthcare system for me is paramount. Mm -hmm. And so I want to know what this government is going to do differently on healthcare delivery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hate seeing Bahamians being subjected to outdoors in the weather, mm -hmm. you know, the elements when they are ill. So I don't know what they're going to do, but they have got to be able to come up with some answers. I know that we cannot bring um, a ship into port and have a floating hospital. Ideally, that would be a great thing, but there mm -hmm. aren't many of those in existence today. So let me know what you're going to do to help the healthcare workers, the frontline workers, and the infrastructure. That is going to be important. Yes, people are going to say that's going to cost money, mm -hmm. but that is where we need to put a lot of emphasis right now. You've got people in there in the finance department looking over the finances. Even if you have got to reshuffle some of the money that has been allocated to other ministries, things that are not as pressing as our healthcare system, then you need to move that money around and realign that into the healthcare system. But you know, we, we have to migrate away from this idea that government needs to be the center of all capital development, et cetera. I mean, to me, I don't see why that is not something that you, uh, not just in cent, but you, you put the charge to private sector and say, okay, how will you increase our, our medical capacity? Um, tell us, and then let's sit down and talk about, okay, what you might need for incentives and stuff like that. Because there, there's a lot of portable hospitals and um, programs and stuff that we could put in place, um, some of which some of the people I was a part of before would have offered. But, I mean, it's just a matter of what we have the will to do. That's, that's you really know, do you know that there are mobile hospitals that mm -hmm. we can employ? Yeah, where everybody does not have to be flown into New Providence because you know, there are they can drive from settlement to settlement mm -hmm. in, in our family islands since we don't have the bricks and mortar in all of these islands. So you know, and then of course there's once again there's technology where persons you know their mm -hmm. their X-rays and all of their diagnosis can be done online. So, you know, it's not all, and you're absolutely right. The private mm -hmm. sector can certainly help with that. The only problem with the private sector helping with our healthcare system is that many people no longer have insurance. Yeah. And, I, you know, health is expensive. Yeah, um, well, and, well, you know, a part I, of the solution that we have to come up with. You know? Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, as I said earlier, and I think somebody recently commented just now, health is wealth. Without our health, Mm -hmm. We're not going to be able to do anything else. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'd like to see I'd like to see what the um, legislation is going to be with regards to executive orders, the heavy handedness mm -hmm. of um, the competent authority um, war on everybody's nerves to the mm -hmm. nth degree. We do not want to see any more heavy handedness, even if there is a competent authority. Right. We want it to be led by scientific data and by those persons who are on the front line. We don't want any competent authority closing us down because they feel that's the best thing to do. So I want that legislation. I, I think most Bahamians would want that legislation to be dealt with and clarified immediately. And of course, hopefully the Ministry of Finance is working out ways that the government is not mm -hmm. hamstrung in other important areas and that we are able to um, start delivering um, better on the healthcare front. Awesome, awesome. So, Neyote, ne uh, uh, how are you pronounce that? Yes. You say, I have uh, so much respect for you, um, Loretta Butler Turner. 
um, firm, direct, decisive, confident, principled, trustworthy. Sounded like they want you to run again. Um, practical, <laughs> with a heart for the people, the list goes on. Uh, I must echo all of those things also. And um, we want to thank you for being on the show with something about Dale Happy Knowles. But before we go, um, we want you to to tell the public what, or have the opportunity to tell the public what you would like for them specifically that you might think that you would like to share with them on this whole new new day. They say it's a new day. Mm -hmm. um, I am so glad that every day that I wake up, it's a new day. Um, I, I really, I posted something on my Facebook page today. Okay. And I just wanted to share that publicly because you know, despite all of our political affiliations and um, alignments, we as a country, we look to North America for so many examples. And when you look back at last November and the debacle they had with their elections and who won and who didn't win and how long it went on for and the violence that erupted, um, I just have to commend the Bahamian people and thank God that we still live in a country that can show so many countries that are bigger than us, more powerful than us, that are wealthier than us, mm -hmm. how we transition so smoothly from one administration to the next. That, for me, in the deepening of our democracy, is probably the hallmark of what we do well. And there was no violence. Um, lots of Lots mm -hmm. of talk, lots mm -hmm. of talk. You know, Bahamians, mm -hmm. we talk a lot. Mm -hmm. But I think that is the most commendable thing. And I pray that God allows us to always go through this process in such a peaceful manner. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you kindly. It was right about the turn up. Um, I promise you an hour, but um, um, well, this is this is what we call a compressed hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, it, actually, it actually felt so, so you know, short, but I thank you because, you know, I'm such a talker. I talk too much. Thank you, Dale. Yeah, I don't know if you're just sharing, but, you know, I just looked up at the screen and realized what time it was because I was just going with the flow of what you were saying and stuff, and I didn't realize the time was flowing, but we really much appreciate it, and you you laid a lot of stuff out for us. It gave us a lot of food to think about, and hopefully gave some guidance and some persons who are there who might have had some questions or challenges with different things with be in a better position to to process what is happening, why it happens, how it happens, and all of the different stuff. And we could grow the Bahamas from strength to strength, and we could change the narrative instead of having all this bickering and chopping at each other and trying to downgrade everybody and, and denigrate everybody, but to raise the lid for everybody, you know? And I want to thank you for the awesome job you're doing. And I want to thank you for even thinking of having me on your show. And may God bless you and something to think about. And may God bless our beautiful country. Thank, thank you kindly. Thank you. So, folks, if you're out there and you want to, to share in these opportunities, these shows, you can let us know what, what subjects you want us to cover. Um, whether you want us to, to be a friend of something to think about, um, you could shoot us a note and then we could discuss it and figure out how you could participate in, in this system that we have here also. Um, our idea is pretty much is to elevate the, the mindset and exposure of, of the Bahamian people and particularly our youth so that we all could raise the, um, be a part of the tide that rises and raises all ships and so forth. And so we thank you once again, um, um, Loretta Butler Turner. Thank you. Um, thank you for being our special guest this evening. And as we always say, we pause, we think about it intention with intentional thought and consider where we go from here. We hope this evening you would have learned something and this would have been of value to you so that it will help you know where you want to go from here with whatever the concerns that you may have. So Loretta, stay safe. You too. Make sure you always um, stay hydrated. I know that's not a problem for you. You always got some. And give um, my give my favorite girl a hello. Well, not we'll our do, producer, we'll your we'll, mom. My mom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the two of them. And uh, and what we also want to say is, by all means, vaccinate or isolate. Now, uh, if you if you're not going to vaccinate, then please do isolate to protect yourself. 
Um, they are the only two main ways that you can protect yourself from this thing called COVID that's going around right now. Whatever they say, it boils right down to those two things. That's from Dr. Knowles' uh, test, if you want to call me a doctor for that. So thank you kindly. Um, we'll be right back here next week. And if we stay tuned, you could see some other links at the end of the show that you can look at more shows on our page if you like the show. And be sure to like, share, and um, let us know what you think about the show. Thank you again, Loretta, and thank all you. the best. Thank God you bless very you. much. Madam producer, thank you kindly, and take us away. Thank you.